Okay, first of all... <sighs> okay, so this one's going to be just right off the cuff, because that's how I feel this uh, story needs to be told, as it were, uh, or, or how this needs to be responded to. <laughs> okay, now, in my last video, my video on Elliot Roger, we... Uh, discussed a lot of the different angles that people have been taking, that the various social justice assholes have been coming out and saying, oh, well, clearly he did it because of my thing that I'm fighting against. And we had John McIntosh and Nia Sarkeesian trying to blame it on their personal agenda, that that was uh, his, his reaction to that was somehow what did it. But <laughs> Gail Dines responded to it, and I was, like, sitting here thinking, Jesus Titty fucking Christ, Gail, please, for once in your miserable, misspent life, have some shred of dignity and decency, have a little shame, have a little respect for the rest of humanity, but no, uh, Gail is quite content to stoop to new lows of journalistic, academic, intellectual, and uh, philosophical disintegrity, if that's a word, um, and she wrote this piece for the Huffington Post, uh, and of course, as you all can guess, she blamed porn for what Elliot Roger did, but what's amazing, what's really remarkable reading the, the article is the way she dodges around it. <laughs> she dodges around the issue. She's found a way to say that Elliot Roger did what he did because he looked at porn without saying Elliot Roger did what he did because he looked at porn. The <laughs> uh, it's, it's this amazing tap dance, and that alone is uh, remarkable, that you could, you could actually uh, kind of tightrope walk your position like this. Anyway, so she says, I have been a radical feminist for as long as I can remember. As I witnessed the marginalization of radical feminism in the cultural discourse, in publishing, and in women's studies programs, I see the feminist movement I once loved become powerless to explain what is happening to women, especially the horrific levels of violence against women. Okay, which what horrific levels of violence against women are you v referring to, Gail? Because the uh, as I I pointed out in a previous video, it's the second of the damsels in distress videos, intimate partner violence, rape and sexual assault, they've all been on the decline, uh, according to the actual credible statistics. All of these have been on the decline. And uh, last time I checked, we live in a culture where the where physical assault or sexual assault of anybody is uh, a crime and one that can be very severely punished. Now, I know that there's this huge, uh, huge thing of, uh, oh, well, only 3% of rapists will ever spend a day in jail. Yet the reason they s people say things like that is because of a woman named Mary Koss that ran a fraudulent study uh, many, uh, many years ago. But anyway, bringing it back around... Uh, it's it, it's always amazing to me when Gail talks about marginalization of her point of view when she gets to be this go-to person. She's she's writing here on the goddamn Huffington Post website, and yet somehow she's being marginalized. Yes, Gail is being marginalized, and uh, incidentally, right now I don't know if you all heard that high-pitched whine that just came through. Yeah, there it is again. I don't know what's causing it, but spare me, you know, infinite comments about oh, there's a high-pitched wine at X number of minutes. Anyway, Gail fucking, uh, Gail thinks somehow that she's being marginalized by, uh, her viewpoint's being marginalized when she's got this book that's being constantly translated into new languages and it's available all over the world and she's flown all over the world to do speaking engagements and lectures and been paid very handsomely for it. And then uh, that, that she thinks she, this voice is being marginalized. And, okay, this the whole concept, these women's, this women's studies thing I, I don't I don't have the inside track on that to know whether or not radical feminism is being um, marginalized within women's studies, but it seems like rather than women's studies, women could just commit themselves to studies 
And but no, we have to uh, install this special little classroom, this special environment in every university that uh, teaches women how fucked up the world is because of men. Blah blah blah. That's a, a side tangent. Anyway. So she goes on to say, This failure has reached a new level following the massacre by Elliot Roger of students at UC Santa Barbara. The media is on fire with women and some men writing about misogyny as the cause, as if that explains why Roger targeted young women and rambled on about sluts refusing to date him. Okay, so she says, quote, she quotes sluts. Let's take a look right here. See, this is great because I have... Elliot Rogers manifesto right here. So let's pull that up right quick. And what we will do is we'll look for find and then we'll go sluts. Reader has finished searching the document. No matches were found. Huh. Sluts. Well, maybe the singular. Ah, here we go. Okay, I wanted to punish them all. I imagined how sweet it would be to slaughter all of those evil, slutty bitches who rejected me, along with the the fraternity jocks they throw themselves at. Okay, there's one use. Let's see. Oh, that's it. Wow, one one time in the entire the entire document. Okay, now this this is going to be critical uh, about the sluts refusing to date him. Uh, he was not. Uh, taking on the uh, the attitude uh, that Gail thinks is fostered in pornography, this attitude of believing that uh, women are, are uh, sluts, what have you, all of that, that, uh, that there's, you know, that, that women are given to some sort of uh, default whoredom, that sort of, uh, that argument that Gail's advocating there. No, what he's arguing, he is actually holding women to a very puritanical standard, and uh, and he did all throughout his materials. He thought less. Uh, he did not uh, believe that sluttiness was somehow a good thing in women or promis- promiscuity or what have you. He uh, saw that as an absolute negative. Anyway, she says misogyny is not something created out of thin air to be caught, much like a cold that drives those infected to commit horrendous acts of violence. It is an ideology produced and disseminated by social and cultural institutions that work seamlessly together to create a social reality that normalizes, legitimizes, and glorifies violence against women. Well, <laughs> what's amazing is uh, we don't, they, you know, I know there are going to be. Uh, Plenty of people write in and and, uh, have a bitch fit about me saying this, but we don't live in a society that glorifies violence against women. Uh, It doesn't, uh, we don't live in a society that normalizes it or legitimizes it. We live in a society where violence against women is illegal. And this idea that there are somehow, uh, the presence of certain ideas have somehow legitimized or normalized it uh, is a complete malarkey. We live in a free society. That mean, that carries with it the responsibility of freedom. That means that you continue to be responsible for your individual actions, regardless of what you've read or what you've seen or what you've heard. Whatever the influences you have around you, you still remain responsible for your actions. And, that is a, and so that is an outgrowth of freedom, and this attitude that, oh, this uh, women are being oppressed because of the very uh, facets of freedom that make this a society worth living in is revolting. But then she goes on to say, <clears throat> Karl Marx, oh, and it, it's an ideology produced and disseminated by social and cultural institutions. Elliot Roger had had some very severe mental problems. I'm not, no, I'm not dismissing it as, oh, he was just crazy. No. The question becomes, why, why Elliot Roger and not so many other people? Why, why him out of all of the possible people, out of all of the people in the world, why him? Why was he so susceptible to this supposed message or the supposed ideology? And from his own words, it came out of nothing but a profound desire to uh, receive the social validation of being popular with women. And 
as I went through in my uh, deconstruction of his quote unquote manifesto, that that was ultimately what it came down to. He wanted success with women long before he had any kind of sexual desire because he was a tiny little fucker that needed uh, constant attention and constant validation. And what was pissing him off was that uh, he got out in the world and realized that, oh, women aren't going to flock to me and take care of my every need the way mommy always does. And that pissed him right the fuck off. So... Anyway, let's get back to Gail. I'm, trying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read it, and this advertisement for Dragon Eternity comes up. Anyway, she says, Karl Marx was one of the first theorists to explain that ideology is not a free-floating set of ideas, but rather a coherent system of beliefs that are purposely and carefully created by the elite class to promote their interests. Using their ownership of key cultural institutions, the elite then set about distributing these ideas until they become the dominant way of thinking. Okay, yeah, that so- I'm sure that sounds really great to you, Gail, but just the fact that Karl Marx said it does not make it the automatic gospel truth. Ka- Karl Marx was trying to wrap rouse the proletariat and he uh, portrays the upper class the bourgeoisie as this one unified force this one unified force that uh, seeks nothing but to dominate and overwhelm and oppress the proletariat now I'm going to turn let me turn this ideology around for you it's very it's a very self-important ideology or a very self-important way of thinking it's a very pat yourself on the back way of thinking it's a great way of making you feel smug and important about yourself when you're a pathetic nobody okay i think and as and this comes no surprise to my regular listeners but i think friedrich nietzsche was a was like the perfect answer to Karl Marx. I know you all are expecting Ayn Rand, but in this case, we're not talking about economics per se. Here, we're just talking about general ideas. So Friedrich Nietzsche said, you know, if you des- if you divide people, you can divide people into uh, the slaves, the masters and the slaves, much the same way that Karl Marx divided people into the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The thing is, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche takes a very turns uh, the ideology of people like Marx, takes it and turns it on its head, and points out that you know when you're a slave, quote unquote, and this could be literally a slave or uh, figuratively a slave uh, in terms of how you relate to the world, your personal feelings, that sort of thing. Uh, perhaps the better term would be a serf, the underclass, that sort of thing. Your attitude is built, your worldview is built entirely around a contempt for the people who are on the top. And your contempt, your attitude, your contempt for the people who are on the top leads you to think that their existence is predicated on oppressing you. And the, what Nietzsche argues, the reality that Nietzsche argues is that the masters, the people, the bourgeois, the people on the top, no. Actually, they're not. They're not fixated on oppressing you because, guess what? They are free in mind and spirit. They're free. They are out enjoying the wonderful world, uh, the wonderful opportunities of freedom. They are out. Uh, they are unencumbered. They are uh, free spirited, and they are not. They don't sit around, uh, basically circle jerking, thinking of new ways to oppress the proletariat or to oppress the slaves or the underclass. They're on the top, and they're enjoying being on the top. And the attitude, Nietzsche's attitude, is that the uh, the slaves, the proletariat, uh, the underclass, remain the underclass because they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be those people. They are the people who adopt the values of strength in numbers, go with the pack, uh, what's good for the most people is good for everybody. All of these morals, all of that morality is slave morality. Uh, The master morality is not encumbered by the needs and the values of the slave morality. And so this idea that, uh, I think that answers Gail really well here, because she has this, uh, she follows the Marxist notion that the the people, the the bourgeoisie, 
are somehow uh, are some, somehow spend all of their time thinking of new ways to uh, oppress the proletariat. The Elliot Roger is actually a wonderful example of what what I'm talking about here. You know, some guy walks by, calls says loser uh, while he's walking uh, to Elliot Roger while he's walking by with a couple of attractive girls with him. Elliot Roger, in his mind, as we see in his manifesto, constructed this insane world where the masters were constantly the the bullies, the jocks, the everybody, uh, all of the people of the world were consciously and intentionally against him. And he believed that to such a degree that he truly, apparently, truly had a clear conscience about going out and uh, shooting up innocent people. That is slave morality. That is that seething contempt for people that are happy and enjoying their lives and uh, living fulfilling lives. And the thing is, uh, Elliot Rogers sees, him th- sees these people and thinks, oh, they're keeping me down, they're pressing me. No, they're happy. They're happy, they're out there enjoying their lives, and you're uh, mad and butthurt because you're not happy like they are, and you're putting your own personal shortcomings off on them. And that is what Gail is doing and Karl Marx are doing here, putting their personal shortcomings and their problems and their contempt and their jealousy off on the people who are enjoying their lives, the people who are uh Able, are and able to enjoy their lives the people who do have the attitude of and the free spirit and the attitude of the masters and all of that and there's this um uh there's the question then of uh literal slavery literal bondage literal oppression where does all of that fall into play well if you were to take a very cold-hearted reading of nietzsche uh you could say that if you don't uh, if you are a slave and you do not gain your freedom or die trying, then maybe you're supposed to be a slave. A kinder, more benevolent way of putting it would be to say, in this world there are leaders and followers. And some people are naturally going to be at the front of the pack, and some people are naturally going to be at, uh, be in the back. And the most compassionate thing we can do for people is create an environment where they can find where they're supposed to be. But you don't get to be at the front of the pack. You don't get to be at the front of the class just because you want to be. If you want the top, if you want to have the highest grade in your class, you got to work for it. If you want to have uh, freedom from the master, you got to work for it. You gotta, uh, you've got to overpower the master. You've got to escape. You've got to win your freedom. And the pro- uh, and the thing is, what Nietzsche identifies in the master-slave dichotomy, there's a third element, an external element, which is the mystic. The mystic comes in and starts feeding off of the slave. And this is where uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche would have something in common. Marx said that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, and uh, that would be very much uh, in line with Nietzsche's way of thinking. That yes, the mystic comes in and says uh, and tries to give the uh, does not liberate the slave, does not set the slave free. What the mystic does is uh, give the slave this attitude of what you are doing now, the life that is be, been put upon you that you've been yoked with, what you're dealing with now, is special. It's important. It's important that you suffer now so that you can attain great rewards later on, and that pacifies the slaves. Now, bringing up Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand expanded upon that idea to say that we have mystics of spirit, which are religious people, uh, you know, priests and um, priests and the institution of religion and all of that. Those are the mystics of spirit. But then she also defined the mystics of muscle. The mystics of muscle would be more people like Karl Marx and uh, Gail Dines and that sort of thing. The people who say that you must suffer in this life for rewards that will be given, instead of rewards that you get in heaven after you die, they are telling you that your rewards will be given on this earth to your great-grandchildren 
to future generations. You're working for a better future. You're working to make the future a better place for everybody, all of this. And that that, that mysticism, that attitude, rather uh, distracts people. It takes people away from. It, it seizes upon the desire that people have to become free spirits and to become uh, be- to better themselves, to uh, rise up, to make a better life for themselves. It, ta- it seizes on that and then channels all of that into this attitude of, I'm going to spend my life suffering either because I think I'll get rewarded in heaven or because I want my great-grandchildren to, ha- to be rewarded later on. Gail, actually, if you go back to the 2007 um, conference, anti-porn conference that I actually started my commentary on her with, she talks about how standing up to your oppressors makes she says um <laughs> she says we hope to tether many of you this weekend you know talking about uh, tethering women to the issue or young women to the issue of porn she says we hope to tether you this weekend uh many of you this weekend and it won't be a tethering it will be a liberation because standing up against your oppressor makes you feel alive and What's amazing is right there, she starts backpedaling. She said tether. She talks about how she was tethered to the issue of anti-pornography. She says, we want to tether you. And then she realizes what she said and says, and it won't be a tethering. It'll be, was it a freeing or liberation, something like that, uh, because standing up to your oppressor makes you feel alive. That is exactly the morality of the mystic. That is the morality of the mystic that says, uh, that takes your desire to live and your desire to be alive and your desire for happiness and enjoyment and fulfillment in life and says, you can find it in this, em- uh, they don't say it literally, but in this empty, meaningless cause, this agenda. Sa- you, you can find personal fulfillment in this uh, by dedicating yourself to uh, everyone else, whoever we determine for you is the, are the people that need your help, we can uh, you will find your personal fulfillment in life through this, and ignore your ignore your desires, ignore what you want out of life, and be tethered. And so that brings us back around to the way that we really need to evaluate Gail and evaluate her Marxist ideology. She is not arguing for she is not uh, arguing for the liberation of the underclass. What she is arguing for is the underclass being harnessed by mysticism. Moving on. She says, misogyny has become the catch-all term to explain why men murder women. Uh and that explanation is true as far as it goes. But if we see misogyny as an ideology, then the key question too rarely asked is what norms, values, and beliefs, uh, what are the, uh, what is the, is where the norms, values, and beliefs that constitute misogyny come from? Unless we believe that men are born misogynists, however, and feminists know only too well too well how dangerous the biology is destiny argument can be, then it is incumbent upon us to uh, explain why some men hate women enough to rape, maim, and kill us. Okay, that's what you say, us. You've not been raped, maimed, and killed, Gail. And honestly, sincerely, I hope you never are. Because that would only serve to further aggrandize you in this bullshit uh, artistry that you call an agenda. But anyway, um, the, um, the, but there is no us. The women who have been killed, who have been murdered and raped by men, they are individuals who were the, at the victim, victimized at the hands of other individuals. They are not props for you to sink your, you know, wrap your tentacles around and hold up as some kind of collective banner. They are not. They are not. They are not the props that you use to inflate yourself and your own agenda and your own ideas by association. And the idea, if she she loves Gail, loves to say 
that feminists reject the idea that biology is destiny. If you go on her Twitter right now, one of her prominent comments, it keeps getting retweeted by uh, lots of well-meaning, dumbfounded dipshits, is she says uh, that porn expects men to be life support systems for erect penises. Uh, women, uh, feminists reject the idea that biology is destiny. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I know, Gail, you've hooked on to this little, uh, this little piece of, um, you know, you've hooked on to this little piece of minute, minute sort of... Um, allegory or uh, metaphor, what have you, uh, regarding what porn does that, yes, porn gives you a hard-on, and you, you've you seized on this little piece of poetry, and you now go around uh, proselytizing it like it's some kind of fact, and you don't have any fact to su- facts to support that, just like you don't have any facts to support the idea that boys get porn by typing porn into Google. You just go on this assumption, these wonderfully articulate, uh, lacy little assumptions. And um, in any event, pi- you know, biology is destiny. Okay, you are a proponent of the ideas of Andrea Dworkin, who proposed that misogyny itself is derived from the physical act of intercourse, that intercourse is violence against women, that women should be in complete, total, and final uh, control of all human sexuality because they are uh, otherwise victimized by it. The idea, or, 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 or let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about Valerie Solanas, how about Valerie Solanus? Her her idea that uh, the male is a uh, is a byproduct of or is a uh, an incomplete female and constructs his uh, philosophy, his worldview around being uh, constructs his misogynistic worldview around hating women because he knows that he's incomplete. Wait, I keep everywhere I turn, I hear uh, bio. I hear biology is destiny talk from feminists that if you changed it from men to Jews, people would immediately understand how horrible it is. But so somewhere in somewhere, apparently Gail thinks that feminists reject the idea that biology is destiny. No, they don't. They're quite certain that biology is destiny. What they're telling you is that you as a man are inherently given to that you as a man are inherently given to uh, cruel, violent, horrible, degrading, disgusting acts against women, that you are a rapist and a uh, misogynist and a murderer and all of these things at your core. And when they say they reject the idea that biology is destiny, what they're saying is come get on board with us discover your humanity, as Gail likes to say. You know, feminists want to help men discover their humanity. Yeah, fuck you. And um, the and come get on board with us, and we will, uh, and that's how we reject biology, that biology is destiny. You can uh, admit that you're a sinner and be saved in our eyes, and now biology is not destiny. Fuck you. I was, the, the same, it's the same thing I tell these, um, uh, these proselytizing assholes, oh, you need to get your soul saved, you need to save your soul, get right with God, you know, you were born a sinner. No, I wasn't. I was not born a sinner. I was, I, I was not born, I did not come out of the womb doing horrible things to other people. I was not born a sinner. I am to be. Uh, I am to be judged. My moral character is to be judged by my actions, not by some predetermined uh, guilt of which from which no innocence exists. The same thing is true here. That you're trying. What you are doing is trying to convince men that they were born into sin and they need to be saved. And uh, and you do the same thing for women too. But this idea that yeah we're born into sin. We were born uh, and. No, I was born fully human. I do not need the help of a this ideology to become fully human. And I don't know if you've noticed, but men and women have been keenly aware of um, have been keenly aware of love and compassion and sympathy and tenderness and all of these wonderful benevolent emotions for as long as the human species has existed. Now we come from a we we do come from a very savage, brutal, bloodthirsty background, but uh, 
you know, hello, we've been evolving out of the the jungle. We've been slowly, we've gotten f- physically out of the food chain. Now we're getting literally out of the food chain, or now we're getting philosophically, rather. We're getting philosophically out of the food chain. We don't, we're realizing we don't have to live as uh, kill or be killed, prey or predator animals. And this, so this idea that uh, that you know everybody has been absolutely horrible and sick and depraved and disgusting throughout the entirety of human existence, and then uh, the oh so wonderful feminists came along, and they're the only people who uh, want to teach us our humanity, who want to demonstrate what it means to be humanity, to be human, to be fully human. And sorry, but I am never going to be like Robert Wozniczer and get up there on the stage hunched over and looking, you know, looking like Droopy the dog and be submissive and shameful and talk about how important it's been that feminism has helped me become fully human. No. Robert Wozniczer became less than fully human when he got up on stage and said that. That that attitude that you're not a human being, you're not even a human being until you have become submissive and downtrodden and subservient to this ideology. That is complete and utter bullshit. And it is a hallmark of any good religious group to teach you that your, um, <clears throat> your, your humanity, uh, you know, kindness and humanity and decency and love and compassion and all of that didn't exist until this particular group came along. <sighs> anyway, she says, the more I read about uh, the more I read about Roger's unspeakable acts, the more enraged I become with the unwillingness of the mainstream feminist movement to take on the elephant in the room, a well-resourced multi-billion dollar a year industry that doesn't just produce misogyny, but actually ties it to male arousal and ejaculation. Mainstream porn has now become so violent that, radical, that when radical feminists describe it in debates and presentations, we are accused... Uh, by uh, including by other feminists of exaggerating and only focusing on the very worst of porn. Yeah, that's what you're doing. And the thing is, you've been ever since, ever since pornography, ever since the days of Playboy, which, you know, if, if Playboy covered the nipples, they'd be Maxim. But anyway, ever since the days of Playboy, you have been, the feminist movement has been stridently, bloodthirsty, steely-eyed in its declaration that this is a horrible, this is horrible treatment of women. To look for, a, to put out a magazine with a picture of naked women in it is absolutely horrible. The worst thing that could ever happen uh, to this horrible, vile thing. And every time, every, every time there's been even the slightest upping of the ante, they have declared that it has been violence against women. And, you know, showing sex on camera, if two people get on camera and have sex, that's automatically violence against women. And Andrea Dworkin, Gail's uh, favorite uh, citation source after Karl Marx, Andrea Dworkin got up and testified before uh, the Mies Commission with ridiculous lies about pornography. I mean, literally, not just things that, like, oh, you're focusing on the very worst of porn, things that don't exist, and, uh, and, and focuses on this horrific world of, um, of just snuff and child pornography, which... Uh, and I, like, and when I say don't doesn't exist, like it's the what the the industry standard or something like that, and uh, and see and and uh, railed venomously about how uh, you know, showing women who are uh, pregnant having sex, like, well, yeah, pregnant women can have sex, or using the skin as if it is a genital. Yeah, you can ejaculate pretty much anywhere. Uh, or, um, they, I'm, I'm not going to keep doing Andrea Dworkin impressions. Anyway, 
the, this idea of just acting astounded and aghast that people aren't fucking the right way. Which, by the way, if you haven't watched my deconstruction of Intercourse, Andrea Dworkin's uh, novel, or not novel, uh, uh, Screed, Intercourse, her, her concept of uh, feminist-approved sex is that the man uh, lies on his back and the woman sits on top of the penis without... It, without the penis actually entering her, she sits on top of the penis and masturbates, and the friction of her masturbating is supposed to cause the man to ejaculate. And that's Andrea Dworkin's idea of sex uh, between a man and a woman. And any th- and actual vaginal penetration by the penis, that, well, that's just automatically rape. And that's where... She get that's where she gets labeled as saying all sex is rape. Well, what she meant, what she'd say is she thought vaginal intercourse was rape. But anyway, so so this idea that she's now going she's now going to shoehorn Elliot Roger into her into her arguments into her worldview. And she goes, she says, in the best case scenario, this is because most mainstream feminists have never actually spent time on the most traveled porn sites. And in the worst case, it is a willful desire to not rock the boat with boyfriends, husbands, brothers, publishers, and tenure committees. What? (laughs) Okay, we know Gail just says whatever the fuck she wants to say with no evidence whatsoever. But seriously, you think, Gail, okay, you think that there are, you think female academics are on the side of porn because they're afraid they'll they won't get tenured. <laughs> you think that women you think that women are apparently, you know, women who voice opposition to you are uh afraid of losing favor with their boyfriends, husbands, brothers, public uh, publishers, maybe publishers if you uh if you're working with a publisher that has a very specific ideology and you start running against it, yeah, I could see that. But boyfriends, husbands, brothers, and tenure committees? <laughs> where, is, where is even one example of this, Gail? You don't have a single goddamn motherfucking example of one of these... Uh, of of one of the pro-porn women, uh, at female academics, public intellectuals out there being uh, saying these things out of fear of of any of those things that is a bold-faced assumption on your part and Hitchens law but then you talk about the most well-traveled porn sites okay the uh, we'll get to that in a second but she goes on to say so here is a test and one that comes with a trigger warning because I have absolutely no respect for any woman in the world and don't think women have spines oh I'm sorry that's not what she said she said so here is a test and one that comes with a trigger warning because trigger warnings are not some right wing plot as recent media stories would have us think but ways to avoid re-traumatizing victims of violence I am going to quote extensively from a popular website that was made even more popular by the outing of Duke student Bell Knox as a porn performer. We all know her name. Okay, by the way, Gail said in a tweet that she was not going to comment on Bell Knox because Bell Knox, she said, has been uh, used and uh, has been used by too many people already. Oh, but now it's convenient. You know, now she's going to comment on Bell Knox when it's convenient to her point. Anyway. So, she goes on to say, we all know her name, or at least her porn name, but does anyone know the name of the porn site she was uh, gag, uh, where she was gagged almost to unconsciousness, smeared with semen to the point that she couldn't open her eyes, slapped and penetrated so roughly that she was gasping and in pain and sobbing? At least at one point, she was pushing the male performer slash abuser away because she couldn't breathe, and in typical porn sex behavior, he dragged her closer to his penis by yanking her hair, spitting in her face, and screaming at her to shut up. The, uh, okay, uh, right now, I'm, I'm going to have to go find this scene in question and get back to you, but uh, right now, she's going. Uh, the website, as she's about to say, is facial abuse. Now, Here's the thing about facial abuse. She likes to say that um, people, uh, women who or, who disagree with her, anyone who disagrees with her, uh, is not spending time on the most well-trafficked porn sites on the internet. Okay, let's go to Alexa.com. 
facialabuse.com. How popular is facialabuse.com? Well, it has a global rank of 64,408, and in the United States, it ranks at uh, 28,366. Now, let's look at a website uh, called met-art or metart.com that focuses on high-end, tasteful, respectful, loving, compassionate erotica. And, oh... It has a global rank of 2,859 and a U.S. rank of 1,725. Hmm. Okay, well, um, you know, maybe that's just an anomaly. Let's look at x-art.com. Wow, a global rank of 3,665 and a U.S. rank of 3,124. Wow, it's almost as if the as if more people are interested in the uh in seeing pornography that features uh happy, sexy, beautiful people having a good time and enjoying themselves in a mutually beneficial environment. Imagine that. It's almost as if uh, things like facial abuse ex- exist on the outside perimeter to hook the uh, bottom feeders of the world, uh, just like most, th- uh, most things that are designed to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Wow, imagine that. It's kind of like, th- it's kind of like saying, well, the popularity of... Uh, the the popularity of Friends on M- N- uh, NBC or the popularity of um, uh, what's what's a good of the West Wing on NBC or the popularity of Downton Abbey or the popularity of um, uh, they're trying to think of another uh, f- uh, fairly intellectual one but that's enough anyway. Uh, the popularity of those shows is meaningless because Jackass is also a popular show. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Jackass seems to you know appeal to kind of a niche market of people that want to be grossed out, and then there's also this high-end intellectual stuff for people who are more interested in that. No, but the very fact that it exists is is unacceptable, and that's the same thing here too. <laughs> You've got you, you. Gail wants to talk about the most common websites. She doesn't cite the most common websites. Before facial abuse, she was going nuts about gagonmycock.com. Let's see where gagonmycock.com is. Let's see. We go to Alexa. Gagonmycock.com. Wow, it has a global rank of fifteen million eight hundred and sixty-four thousand five hundred and seven. <laughs> Oh, isn't it? I mean, see, this is why Gail tra- Gail only uh, traverses the most popular porn sites. Yeah, because yeah, the the most popular porn sites because the website she cites the only one really that she cites uh, that could be considered construed to have any uh, questionable content on it uh, that's popular would be Kink, and. Uh, I say questionable because yes, that does include lots of uh, simulated torture, bondage, all of that, and that has a global rank of eleven thousand one twenty-eight and a U.S. rank of five thousand four hundred and forty-one. So that's fairly popular. But the thing of it is, uh, all of that on kink, all of that is done under very controlled circumstances, and the uh, the copy on the website makes it very clear that this is for people who indulge in this sort of kinky behavior. They are not advocating an actual worldview or trying to dis- trying to uh, portray how people ought to be treated. And uh, contrary to what Gail uh, and many others would like to think, uh, kink is actually very highly regarded within the industry for how well it treats its models as performers. But anyway, so <clears throat> then we go... Um, so it says, yes, the site is called Facial Abuse, and the images and videos that populate it can only be described as torture, with no pretense that this is about consent or mutually enjoyable sex. The text describes in unbearable detail what they are doing to women. It says, and then she quotes, it says, Big tits check, airhead check, daddy issues check. Brooke Ultra has all the makings of being the next big deal in big tit porn. I can totally see the L.A. companies gobbling up this cunt, but we had her first. Today she was trained to be a submissive little whore, taking cocks in all three holes. Pauly... <clears throat> 
Polly Harker blew her asshole out with his giant knob. We shot some great fucking anal gapes with this pig, so much that you could <clears throat> that you could see what she had for dinner last night. Another well-rounded scene with a model who's top shelf. Enjoy this, and when you get to see her all over the place, remember who taught that cunt the ropes. Yes, yes, Gail, that is extraordinarily vulgar. But here's the thing. <laughs> That doesn't mean it's torture. You know what, and you know why? Because the consent of the person involved. And you don't have some kind of magic power. You, your radical feminism does not give you a magic wand to override the consent of the person involved. And so, no, it's not torture. It's people getting off on weird, kinky, gross shit. That's what it is. And your inability to understand that is not a greater knowledge or awareness of the world. It's narrow-mindedness and short-sightedness on your part. And she goes on to say, While most social and political institutions create woman-hating ideology, name one other that delivers it in such a crisp, succinct, unambiguous manner. Name one other cultural institution that prides itself on torturing women as its reason de terre. Raison de whatever, I, I don't know what the pronunciation is, and I don't care, so please don't fill up the comments with telling me how to pronounce it. Anyway, okay, she. this is what, if you watch my Anita Sarkeesian uh, Early Years video part two, this is an example, I'm not saying Gail took this directly from that, obviously, but it's just a common manipulation, it's a common neuro-linguistic programming to... Uh, have this, of course, buried within the statement. While most social and political institutions create woman-hating ideology, name one other that de uh, that develop delivers it in such a crisp, succinct, unambiguous manner. Well, uh, first of all, it's not uh, it's not unambiguous. That text that Gail just cited is commenting on that person. And you can't something you can't quite get across to uh, the social justice warrior crowd is that criticism of one person does not mean criticism of all people that fall into that person's demographics. I got into this a couple weeks ago with the fuckwits that support Adria Richards. He, uh, you know, I criticize, I say, what she did was uh, horrible. She got a father of three fired from his job over a complete non-issue about something that was none of his business, and they immediately snapped back with, Oh, well, you're just mad because she's a black woman and she got uppity. No, no, I, I said nothing about that. That has nothing to do with it. I am not making a racial argument here. I said nothing about race. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, so she goes on to, uh, um, so, so we have this assumption here. We have this assumption buried in the statement that uh, most po social and political institutions create woman-hating ideology. Really? Like what? Because, you know, uh, last time I checked, the media of the world was awash in things about uh, positive messages about women. And don't get me wrong, I am not saying that we shouldn't have positive messages about women. I very much disagree. I just think, we, uh, or, excuse me, I very much agree that we should have positive uh, messages out there about women. What we need to have, however, are actual positive messages and not this condescending, veiled insult uh, ideology crap that the uh, rad films like Gale push. Anyway... Uh, no, I'm not going to take as default the idea that most uh, social and political institutions do that. Uh, again, Hitchens' Law. Now she goes on to say, Porn is now the major form of sex education in the Western world. You have nothing to support that, Gail. You never have. Hitchens' Law. And it produces an ideology that makes women seem disposable sluts who are undeserving of dignity, bodily integrity, or the slightest shred of empathy. Again, Hitchens' Law. Whatever psychological disorders Roger had, he was sane enough to internalize the pornographic ideology so perfectly embodied in facial abuse and the thousands of other websites with the same story. Oh my God, Gail. Oh my God, if God exists, let me select a God to worship so that I may blaspheme its name. Oh my God, Gail. I mean, seriously. <laughs> Have you... 
Have you even... Okay, I spent a miserable week last week reading that little fucker's um, stupid, asinine manifesto. Okay, you clearly know absolutely nothing about this kid, Gail. First of all, he did not see himself as this vulgar, uh, depraved uh, human being. He saw himself as supremely refined... He was refined, the ultimate high class. He called himself the Supreme Gentleman, even though, you know, last time I checked, the Supreme Gentleman is not somebody that throws coffee on people. But anyway, uh, he he called himself the Supreme Gentleman. He thought he was above the herd, above the fray. He thought he was above everybody. He was the decent human being. He was the one who would treat women well. He spent his whole life enraged because he believed that the guys who were getting the girls were all uh, cretinous, horrible, depraved, despicable assholes, and he was the better human being, and he was above all of that. That was his mindset. But furthermore, Gail, and something that I know because I actually read the little fucker's uh, manifesto, and you... uh, either ignored it completely and went straight to writing this article or, uh, you know, paid one of your research assistants to skim over the uh, manifesto or, or worse yet, paid one of your research assistants to ignore the manifesto and go write this article. Whatever the fuck you did, you know, abs- you, ha- you don't seem to know anything about this piece of shit. He held women to this very, very uh, almost celibate, chaste, conservative impression of honor and dignity and chivalry. He believed that uh, he he believed that he was refined and decent, and everybody and he's, he wasn't, but um, but that everybody else was uh, sleazy and depraved. He was in complete. He was infuriated because he saw himself as being. Com- in complete opposition to this attitude. But more so than that, Gail, more so than that, what you would know if you had ever bothered to look at this little fucker's manifesto is that he d- was not a porn user. He saw porn only a small handful of times in his life He only cites like three or four instances in his manifesto, and they're all negative. They're all negative experiences. He didn't like looking... He was disgusted by seeing people have sex. He was. He says he was disgusted by people uh, seeing people have sex. It made him feel horrible, uh, afraid, guilty, uh, dirty, all of this stuff. He did not like pornography. And from his own... Uh, by his own description, he was not even very adept at finding pornography. Right, he was right at right at the age that you say boys should be able to log. Uh, boys go on the internet, type porn into Google, and find all of this porn. He was right at that age, at exactly the era when you say that boys go and do things like that, can go and do that. He was right at that age. He was between eleven and fourteen in the mid to late nineties. Um, excuse me, the mid to late 2000s, the uh, mid to late 2000s, when you were on the lecture circuit saying all of this shit, he was a teenage, a young teenage boy sitting at home, completely unable to access pornography uh, by the standards that you say boys should be able to. He could not work that out. Now, I think that's pretty lame that he couldn't figure out something so simple, but he said he didn't know how to access porn sites. He says, at most, he says, one time his mom caught him looking at pictures of hot girls on the internet, and he doesn't say exactly what he was looking at, but by his own admission, he did not like looking at nude pictures, even nude pictures of women. Seeing women nude scared him. And all of this, I mean, this is a completely unaddressed part of his psyche. We don't know what in the fuck would have gone through his head if he'd actually had the opportunity to have sex with a woman. Well, excuse me, he actually did have the opportunity several times. If you read the manifesto, he's just not fucking paying attention to what's going on around him. But anyway, um, he was put off by that. And so to say that he's internalized it perfectly, I think I can say with relative certainty that if you could, uh, if you could 
ask that to Elliot Rogers directly, he would probably tell you that he thought he was uh, the complete opposite of this sort of thing. He truly believed that he was the one who would treat women wonderfully and, and, and he was the gentleman and he was refined and all of the rest of these guys were just uh, scum and filth and all of that. So your bullshit attempt to shoehorn your little agenda into the Elliot Rogers mythos is, uh, is completely and utterly wrong It is inappropriate, it is insensitive, and it is vile. And, you know, Gail, I know you like to, uh, you know, you you condescend and you put people down and you say, oh, you know, like, you, oh, isn't that being a little bit, was it a a little bit hyperbolic or whatever you said to me on Twitter that time? You know, all this stuff. But no, Gail. This is absolutely revolting. And the Huffington Post published this shit, and I'm guessing they probably paid you a pretty uh, a hefty sum to write this bullshit. But everything you've said here is wrong. You have made one statement after another that is not a, is not supported by any factual base uh, by any factual backing whatsoever. Then you've turned around and uh, declared that this magical la-la land that exists only in your head and the heads of people who are gullible enough to believe this shit, you have said that this is what uh, was the cause of, uh, or, or contributed to what Elliot Rogers did, that he embodied this, this attitude perfectly. No, no, he didn't. He did not. He was literally. I mean, if anything, his uh, if his if his insane murderous actions were based on anything, it was based on seeing himself as the complete antithesis of this. In fact, w- one of the very telling things is when he's in his manifesto when he starts fantasizing about uh, when he starts fantasizing about. Um, putting women in concentration camps and all of this. He doesn't... I, I kept waiting for the part where he decides that he's going to... Uh, he, he fantasizes about forcing women to have sex with him as his sex slaves and all of that in the manifesto. It never comes. His only interest is in depriving everyone else of the enjoyment that he's not allowed, he hasn't been allowed to have. And that's that really is... We're talking about slave morality. That really is slave morality. His concept of not, uh, his concept of being in control is not being able, uh, being able to do what you know, enjoy all the sex he wants to have. It's depriving everybody else of, um, of it. His whole concept of, uh, his whole concept of being a master of his life, of anybody else's life, is holding the whip. That's the only. That's all he's got in his head. He doesn't. He only sees. He only craves being the person doing the whipping instead of uh, being someone that can be above and beyond all of that, who can be the ubermensch, the overman, who can overcome uh, this this human dichotomy. She goes on to say, mainstream commentators and feminists tie themselves in knots trying to avoid any discussion of the way porn is implicated in violence against women. They talk about porn as empowering, as fun, as a celebration of women's sexual agency, and then express outrage when men act out the woman-hating messages that are, uh, that are the constituent elements of porn. Okay, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of the porn that, uh, the, the porn about uh, gunning women down and trying to run them over with your car and stabbing people to death and all of that. Uh, and, and this is somehow the standard thing in porn? No. And then uh, she goes on to say, radical feminists who... Uh, make porn a central part of our activism are not pick your slur, anti sex, prudish man haters, censors, or ugly bitches who are jealous of porn stars. Rather, well, not all of you are those things, but anyway, rather, we fight the porn industry because we know that, uh, that it, 
we know that as long as this tsunami of woman-hating ideology, ideology continues to shape masculinity, there will be a never-ending supply of Elliot Roger laying in wait for the next batch of victims. I think I've said all I need to say. If you would like to experience artistry that is undiluted by the whims and agenda of the hipster Puritans, then I invite you to try my science fiction fantasy web series, The Vessel Chronicles, or my anthology series, Dark Therapy, as well as check out my band, Leaving Babylon. If you're so inclined, donations to support my video projects as well as my larger artistic goals are greatly appreciated and can be donated via patreon.com slash jordanowen42. Thank you for your time.